Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We are at Warner Chapel Production Music with Pat Weaver. Lovely to see you. Nice to meet you. Scott Rymond, how are you? Well, thank you. Excellent. And they are going to take us around the studio, which is Skylight Studios, is that correct? Correct. Uh, yes, I got that bit right. All right. A year old, little baby. <laughs> a year old. And we're going to have a little chat about, well, I suppose, production music, mm -hmm. what you do. Right. Excellent. Give us a little bit of your uh, your journey, how you got here. Well, it's a long one, so I'll give you the short version. Um, so I was an English major, and the only reason I was an English major is because I tried to major in music for one year. And uh, when I went to school, it was very different. You had a choice of majoring in composition or performance. There was no music business or anything. And what did you play? Um, flute. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> they, I couldn't get in as a pianist, so I, I took performance as flute, and um, it became very clear that I was never going to make a living playing flute, which was I, what I wanted to do. Um, so I switched to English, and um, that landed me in various marketing departments. Um, and long story short, I eventually ended up, my first music gig was at Capitol Records in the uh, lacquer, tape, and hardware division. <laughs> lacquer, tape, and hardware division. Yes. A whole department dedicated wow. to the class. A whole department. Yeah. And I was a secretary, but I could write. So I went and knocked on the door at publicity, and I just started writing um, freelance bios and press kits for them. and then. Um, positions kept coming open in that department, in the publicity department, and they'd get filled, and then that person wouldn't work out. That happened three times. They hired three different people. None of them worked out. <laughs> and so finally, uh, they said, okay, you're, you're hired. So that was my first real job as uh, publicity at Capitol Records in the tower, and um, eventually became manager of West Coast Publicity, and um, and then somehow from there, I started working for custom music houses, again, as a kind of glorified administrative assistant to the CEO. So kind of watched and learned what was going on there and um, eventually became an executive producer. And so for 15 years, I worked for custom music houses. So I worked for Ad Music and um, Music for Nugent. I don't know if anyone knows who those people are, but um, they're, they're really high-end custom music houses specializing mostly in advertising. And that's why I learned the music for picture business and kind of where it became all clear to me what turned me on was not working with artists at Capitol Records trying to make them famous, but um, telling a story with music. When you're doing advertising, you really learn fast. You have 30 seconds to tell a story, to create a feeling. The comical ads were the hardest, you know? You gotta land the joke. We did every kind of music you, you could want back in the day. Um, so that's really where I learned working with composers, working with clients, working with picture, um, and then eventually ended up at Discovery. That's where I was on the other side. So I went from being a music vendor to hiring composers and custom music houses and became head of music for their, um, well, their, their whole family of channels. So you presumably went there because you had the skill to talk to the composers and you could bring in a different perception. Well, yeah, it's a, a trick, I think, that a lot of people don't have is being able to talk to clients and relay what they're saying to the composer and talk to each of them in a way that they'll understand and be on the same page. Because you can sit in a room with a client on a creative call with a composer, well, with three composers, let's say, and the minute that call's over and the client's gone away, the three composers will have completely different takeaways from what that whole conversation was about. 
So I learned how to write a brief. It's like, no, this is what they want. And this is when they want it. And this is when it needs to do this and when it needs to go there. And this is what not to do. And um, so the first thing I did when I came to uh, Warner Chapel was made everybody write briefs. It's true. <laughs> it's true. They're good. It's a good thing. I mean, that, I mean, you, you know, what you want from the composer is laid out and known ahead of time. But, you know, that's the thing is like, it's, it's kind of a bad idea to put composers in the same room as the client sometimes because they're emotionally attached to the music. They're, I mean, this is generalizing, but they're not great listeners. You know, they don't, they're not always detail people. So yeah, it's like when you watch Pat in these client meetings, just like the meticulous note-taking, listening, asking the right questions, it's like composers aren't great at that. Sure. So yeah, being, being a, a translator is like a big part of, you know, Plus, if they've the been practicing the flugelhorn, they just took up the flugelhorn, they're going to work that in. <laughs> Right. Somehow. <laughs> New reverb plug in. And it's like, this, this yeah. has a lot of reverb on it. When... It's true. You have to contain them a little bit. So what's your story? Well, I was an organ major. Organ major? Yeah. I thought you were a drum major. No, I played I played drums. I did came did the whole band thing, you know, growing up. Got into recording with a Porta studio. Kind of came that route and ended up in college somehow thinking I was going to be a music major with like two years of piano lessons under my belt. And I did, but the piano guys didn't want me because I was not pedagogy level piano guy, but the organ guys took me. So I went that route and I had the little organ shoes and everything. I was great. Yeah. It was something to behold, but I, I knew I wanted to get into writing music for film and television. Mm -hmm. Um, but didn't necessarily want, I was in Utah and didn't want to move out of Utah. I liked it there and everything I liked to do was in Utah. So I, there was a company there called Nonstop Music, which is the Warner Chapel bought Nonstop Music to create Warner Chapel production music. Oh, I see. So I started doing work with them again, because they really had no choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, I was around and I could sort of kind of do the music and they, you know, they paid for my education um, and you had to, not my, you know, learn, not my learn. university, but yeah, it was learn like, you yeah. Things. And they were doing stuff at the highest level. You know, they were creating music for ABC, ESPN, doing lots of sports programming, trailers. Um, trailer, lots of trailers. So it's like, yeah, it was, it was sink or swim. And um, I, so I came up as a composer uh, with them and eventually started producing music for them, doing library albums and more so when non when nonstop was purchased. And then, so I continued working with them as a freelancer for about 10 years until Pat and Alec came on and then they hired me to come on full time. And then you moved here. And then I moved here. Sunny Los Angeles. Yes. Which is very different. You know, it's a. From work. Utah. Well, from, from Utah, but just the job itself, you know, going from being a freelancer and, you know, kind of the freedom that affords you to working for a corporation is... Enslavement? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, that's, yeah, obligations. That's a, a, maybe a better word. It's, you know, you're, you're, tied, it's, you're tied to it, but it's, it's also but like... Consistency. Well, yeah, and that's, that's important. I don't think there's consistency you know, in having a job versus being a freelancer. I don't think there's much difference. People lose their jobs all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I just felt that I was like perpetually unemployed, you know, for, <laughs> for 20 years I was unemployed, but still managed to make a living and, you know, have like a lot and have a lot of extra time. Yeah. So as a freelancer, yeah, I was, I was skiing every morning and hiking and, oh. but then I could work at night, you know, it was like, but you're one of the fortunate thing. ones. Yeah. There's a lot of freelancers that um, are very good, yes. but they still have to hustle for whatever reason. And um, yeah, well, and, and yeah, don't don't get me wrong. There was plenty of hustle and a lot of all nighters, you know, to 
to get you know where I am and what I'm doing. It didn't just happen. So it's so, a lot of work and luck, opportunity. You know. So what are you doing here? What is your vacant system here? So here I am basically developing their catalogs. A lot of them, the ones that I was doing before, which is a the Groove Addicts family of catalogs, which was purchased from a company here in LA, as well as the nonstop catalogs and stuff that they had going in Salt Lake. And that's all based here now out of Los Angeles. So, you know, that's conceptualizing and basically executing all of this music start to finish. Um, and that's a lot of music. So I think between us, all, all of our owned catalogs, we probably do 120 to 140 albums a year. Um, so that's, you know, it's 1400, 1500 songs that we have to fully produce. And, you know, this isn't, there is some stuff that's in the box, but so much of it goes beyond that with recording and, you know, big sessions, whether it's strings or we brass or drums. Tomorrow. Yeah. So it keeps us busy. String day here or? No, this one's at Ocean Way in Nashville. So we'll be remote. We got very used to doing the remote thing during COVID. So we were, you know, we did string dates and brass dates all over the world. It was whoever was open. So at first there was a time where Australia was the only place open. So we were at Trackdown doing a major session there, uh, did tons of stuff in Budapest, um, Nashville, Salt Lake City. I mean, we were everywhere you know, just trying to get stuff done. And we did. I mean, we still managed to crank out, you know, over a hundred albums in one of those COVID years. Yeah. Which is, you know, and it's changed the way we work and what we find acceptable. And, you know, and it, a lot of the tools came along with that as far as like audio movers and Source Connect. And I mean, Source Connect was around, but everything kind of got better. So tell us about these albums. You made a hundred albums, hundred and forty albums uh, currently. I, uh, each one of those. I mean, how do you decide the purpose? You say we need to create this kind of music for this reason, um, or are you creating them because, or a combination? People are coming to you and say we need X, Y, and Z, so you make it. Mm -hmm. What What's the process? Um. Well, the answer is yes to all of that. Right. So you, there are composers that approach us with concepts they've already done or styles, okay. and they say, hey, I've got these tracks for sale, and we'll just buy some of those. So that's an album okay. um, that we can just pick up if we think it's something that we need. But we'll remix it. Yeah, we'll right. remix and we're ads, we make it right. That's the thing yeah. is we have a certain you know, level of you know, production that we will accept and put what out. What constitutes an album? Ten songs? Typically, it depends, and we do a lot more than music. We do a lot of sound design and you know trailer tools and stuff like that. Or or a trailer album, you know, may not have ten songs. It might have fewer, but those are you know very expensive to make. So it kind of depends. You know, I have to balance budget and needs. But we identify the needs based on like feedback from our sales team. You know, the charts, whatever's charting at the time, what's popular. And shows, yeah, shows, TV, film. You know, we can see where the trends are going, and we have lots of different catalogs, and some of them are very focused. Like we just launched a catalog called Hellscape, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's doing very well. And it's what you'd imagine, but it's underscore um, for all your hellish needs. Yeah, we're having lots of fun with that one. We have big clients who consume a lot of music, so you know, we have to cover a lot of ground. So if a, if a client has a blanket license with us, they consume crazy amounts of music, whether it's for promo or in show. So we have to do everything. So it's sort of about, are you repping the composers as well? Meaning they get the, they get the album, they go, we like this. You're not representing the composer. We're not, may have not in the typical the sense. Mm -hmm. um, we're, they're not under contract to us. Right. Um, although we are um, really happy, happily welcoming um, a composer slash producer who will be starting with us next week, who's awesome. But most of them are, you know, it's a case by case. Sometimes we'll do a series with a composer. Sometimes we'll do a co-venture. 
um, and start a library um, with um, a composer that's we've worked with a lot and is reliable and um, we'll just go into a venture together and we'll help fund it. Um, we've been quite successful with Glory, Oath and Blood, working with Rob Bennett, doing that. That's a big trailer catalog. It does quite well. We rep the composer, but not in a, oh, right. not in a, like a... Yeah, I just meant this to say they, they love one of your CDs and they're like, particularly these three songs, we'd like more music for our mm. series based on that. You then, you then go back to the composer and say, hey. You that's a fantastic you question because that's what Scoremongers is going to be all about. Right. So we're, as I explained, we're doing different um, genres. And within those genres, we'll work with the same composer on a series of albums. And it's all very tailored underscore um, with a certain palette and a certain tonality. And those albums are meant to be able to score a whole series if needed. So... The idea is if you like this palette, you can license this music and we can also um, create custom tracks based on that same palette. In which case, a lot of people, well, we want to work with that composer and we make that happen. Most of the time, and I know this when I was at Discovery, this is how we'd work from the other side. We'd be presented with, um, well, here's five composers, and here's examples of their work, and um, we just kind of dial it in. So we represent them as needed kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Gives us, you know, an option. We're just millions of options. It's great for both of you mm -hmm. because often composers get wrapped into something where there's an exclusivity and then they can't morph where they need to. Right. So yeah, they can they can go out and work for whoever they want to, and we've certainly had a lot of albums we've made that you then see that composer go make something very similar for a competitor. Mm. It's never as good, but you know they can <laughs> do that. I mean, that's that's the thing is, if we see an album be really successful, there are times where we go back to that composer and say, "This thing was a hit. Can we do more of it?" But rarely does that work to say do the same thing because it just whatever it is there's diminishing returns so it's like well what's the next evolution of that idea or concept or that music um you know you can do this thing and have it be amazingly successful put out the same exact album and it does nothing so it's hard to know you know what will and won't work all the time but yeah never we're never trying to get guys to repeat Right. the same music because it just doesn't it, it always comes up a bit uninspired so what's the company officially called warner chapel production music that's our parent company so warner chapel owns us warner music group owns them so it's yeah. like that offers kind of a unique position warner for chapel us production. as a production music company because we have a major who is our parent company and so right. we have access to things that others don't and opportunities that they don't. So it's kind of, it's pretty cool. Great. One of the things we're doing, for instance, what this relationship allows, we're doing a, a new label with Warner Chapel Publishing called Run For Cover, where we're re-recording um, covers of songs they own 100% of. So it's kind of taken the library concept of one-stop shopping, master publishing, just one person can give you a quote to the cover level. So it's all under one building and um, we're trailerizing some fun songs and we're looking forward to launching that. So you work mainly with composers. Are you sourcing them? Are you going to find people? Are you taking, do you take unsolicited stuff? How do you, how do you get those said composers? Yeah, like I was saying before, the beauty of our world is that we kind of exist out of the limelight, which cuts out a lot of um, extraneous ego um, and uh, layers of approvals and um, all the personalities you have to deal with and the high profile artists and all that comes with them. So we mainly work with composers and songwriters and producers that aren't of a name stature. So there are exceptions to that, but mostly 
there's so many composers in the world today. There's so many composers on this block right now. I mean, mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but uh, it's tough. It's, it's very competitive. And we constantly source composers around the world. And some of it's word of mouth, some of it's referrals. Um, a lot of people submit through our website. And um, I've personally worked with um, quite a few of people I've met that way. Um, actually, people I'll never meet in person because they're in Romania or they're in um, Norway because of obviously how everyone works now remotely. It's so you're, you're, you're able to work with anyone anywhere in the world. So these composers come to us. They're from all levels, um, all different kinds of backgrounds. And then we have producers because we produce every kind of music under the sun. So that includes everything from big orchestral trailers to hip hop. So we work with like a hip hop producer or a country producer that helps us source just the right singer and the right musicians. And um, so you, you cut out all that layer of dealing with an artist who's concerned about their image and their craft services, <laughs> and they're always three hours late. This business is, it's just pros toiling behind the scenes. That's fantastic. Do you, because earlier when we, we first started talking out there, you were talking about, because you've been on the other side of the glass, you've been, the glass maybe not the right analogy, but you've been the person hiring yourself. Do you, try to establish relationships so that you become a one source or do you find that a lot of the time you're competing against other people like you continuously or have you got lots of relationships where you're, you're in there, you've got the show, you're the, you're, the, you're the team? Was it a combination of all of those things? It's a combination. I mean, we're, an, we're a very ambitious team. I've only been with um, Warner Chapel Production Music for three years and um, they brought me and Alex Sharp on to kind of revamp, rebuild, rebrand the company. There's uh, a lot that's transpired in the last three years. And part of it has been um, not only building up our library to be more relevant, to just continue the high level of production value we've had before I even got here, um, but to also move production to LA, but also to advance our custom music services. And that's where we want to be the go-to for a client, where we establish a rapport and a relationship, because that's how it works in the custom world. But then in the licensing world, that works too. If you have a music supervisor that knows she can trust or he can trust, a lot of them are women, that what they need, you're going to give them, or if you don't have it, you'll let them know, they're going to come back to you. So it, it is all about relationships in the end. Yeah, I think from being somebody who's pitching music, I used to, you always wanted to feel like you could have a relationship with somebody who would come back to you because I'm sure many people watching this have, have pitched music and they may get a revision or may hear nothing whatsoever. And that's, you know, it's very hard to grow in those circumstances because you don't really understand what somebody's looking for. You get that brief, you know, we were joking about earlier, you know, it's got to be a blue sky with a this, that and the other. And definitely not. And then they give the genre and uh, it can be very, very frustrating. Um, now, you've been on the other side. So I presume one of the, the, the beauties is, is that you can bring that knowledge in. That's what uh, also Alec came from the other side, too. And it is I think that's why I got hired. Right. Um, it does help because you do know what the competition competition is offering, mm -hmm. and and you do know how high the bar is. Going back to the brief, I I'd like to position Warner Chapel Production Music as a different type of company compared to our competitors. A lot of our competitors, on many levels, um, we're pretty hands on with our composers. We don't just write up a brief and then send it out to a bunch of composers and, and they all work on it and we pick what we like the best. A lot of companies operate that way. What I do personally, and then Scott can speak to how he operates, but I will have an idea or a composer will have an idea that he'll pitch me or she 
and then we'll have a conversation before the brief's even written. Because the composer's gonna bring something to the table too in that conversation. And my goal is to always have the composer be inspired by the project. If, you, if they're excited and inspired, it may not end up exactly where it started out, it's gonna, but it's gonna be great. Um, so yeah, we, and then we listen to the demos and there's lots of back and forth. And then we, we mix in house and we um, often sweeten tracks and add string sections and brass. Or sometimes we'll try different singers just to get that right singer. So it's very hands-on. Would you say you work that way? Yeah. I mean, I think it's um, <clears throat> always trying to play to their strengths. You know, it's like I don't, there were sort of pre-internet version of production music and then post-internet. And the post is everything that Pat talked about as far as not being geographically tied mm -hmm. to a group of composers or, you know, basically limited options to where you could get somebody to come into the studio or you could work with them on writing or even passing back and forth sessions. I mean, it just was so difficult and it's not anymore. You know, back, I think that's how I got to start in the industry they were forced to use me because they didn't have any options, you know? So it's like, <laughs> they were willing to pay a certain amount of town. money. I was in town <laughs> and I was like, okay, this guy can sort of kind of do, you know, whatever popular style at the time. But you were also forced to use that same guy who could do like techno to do maybe a jazz cue or some other genre that they weren't strong at. But that's not really the case anymore. So post-internet means we go to the people that are really, really good at what they do. So I'm not typically asking the rock guy to do an orchestral you know, arrangement, even though there are those guys that can do both. Um, things have changed in that way. So you know, we have options and, and we like to play to the composer's strengths and, and that they feel inspired. And we'll take one, like I had a recently worked with um, Steve Wilmot. He's uh, co-writes with One Republic and produces them. He's, he's wonderful. And um, he did an instrumental album for us that was just all grooves and uh, electronic, but he plays drums. So with processed drums, it was just very, very groovy, fun. He did 10 tracks for us, and then, but five of them were kind of, I call it goth groove. Yeah, they were very dramatic. And so I took five of those, went to his guy, Mark Moore, who knows trailers. He knows the trailer world inside and out. He's brilliant. I said, could you do anything with these? Could you slice and dice and add two and, and make it into um, a trailer? It's like, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> So you can do it, you can do it, just try. And we ended up with this, the 10 track album, but then we also ended up with this really fun five track EP of big bombastic over the top trailer music, just by, you know, kind of working with people in their specialties. And it came out great. Yeah. Have, you, have you had it synced You've been in trailers? It's, we're just going to release it soon. It's part of um, Scoremongers, which is a new label of ours coming out. We're very excited about it. Fantastic. And is, is that label going to specialize in any particular genre? Or? Uh, Scoremongers is pretty unique in that it is, mo except for this one series in it, um, which is kind of trailers and promos, it's kind of high-end underscores, for lack of a better description. So um, it's divided into different genres. So there'll be like an Americana, uh, ambient, um, piano hybrids, ambient strings, indie score. So, but it's all catering to um, editors who are trying to score a narrative program. So, we're trying to make the music super flexible and providing uh, lots of submix options and alternate mixes and stems. We'll see. I mean, that's, uh, Scott, that's a, whew. The, these days, because you can do so many variations, mm. um, I'm sure that, that takes up an enormous amount of time and second guessing. Um, 
could obviously open up lots of opportunities like you're, you're, you're describing yeah. as well, but the, the workload now must be pretty massive. It, it is, and, and the track counts get extreme. You know, it's, this is, some of them are, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 tracks on any given release just with submixes and alts stems. and stems. And it's like, and then how do you make that work? That's, you know, a, a good amount of our time and energy is spent in making that stuff findable searchable right it's like how do you dig in this enormous stack of music and find what you need so metadata is a big part of what we do you know it's like and that that goes for everyone <laughs> you know in this business because now that you know it's it's not just us it's warner chapel production music but if you had us plus three competitors all in one aggregator you know like a software that is supposed to find you library music. Well, how do you make your track get found among all that stuff? That's that's pretty tough, and it's a sure. no, nobody has the answer. You know, it's like we don't control algorithms on anybody's computer. If it's you know an NBC or something, we don't know how they search, how their software returns results. So it's pretty tough to kind of balance all of that. So presumably, you spend a lot of time and investment in your website. Yes making stuff infinitely searchable. I do remember taking a meeting with, I'm blanking on their name, but it was a, a while ago at, at, at Fox, and he told me tons and tons of stories about how music was chosen. A lot of it was rewarding and fantastic, and a lot of it was completely soul-destroying. You know? <laughs> um, like going to a big band, I won't say who it is, but you know they wanted a little piece of an instrumental because it fit really well, and they'd cut a trailer around it, when they approached the band, the label, the publisher had come up with some enormous figure. And of course, it was just 15 seconds of instrumental. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, I just have guys that I can call and go do something like that. that hits the same, you know, points yeah. that I want, um, which is, I presume there's some of that going on for you. You'll get you're getting. Sure. Yeah. Well, we're that's the other part of our business is um, we're affordable and we're one stop. We own the masters, we, we own or control the masters and the publishing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to five different people to get approval and negotiate a rate. For the existing music, part of the custom services is just customizing library music. Somebody will like a track, but want it tweaked a picture or want it to build more, or et cetera. So we do a bit of that. And then we also do replacements. Um, we have a team that all they do is respond to searches all day long. We need a replacement for this song that we couldn't get. Uh, a lot of that. Should we do a studio tour? Thank you sure. ever so much. Yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Yay. So this uh, is a Beatles contact sheet that I pilfered um, from Capitol Records. Do they know? No, they do now. <laughs> it was in a dusty old cardboard box in the back of a supply closet mm -hmm. with Pink Floyd's original artwork from Dark, White, Dark Side of the Moon. But they had a couple Beatles contact sheets from their first trip over, and they were like marked up, you know? Oh, I said something. So why is it? It looks I like my glasses yeah. on. Oh, you're right. Yeah. yeah anyway, so I grabbed it and I kept it for years in hiding because I was so paranoid, but I finally said, screw it and blew it up and now it's here. The artwork throughout the building is all kind of homage to Hollywood and, you know, old, old Hollywood really. Yeah, old Hollywood. So just walk, walk through, try to catch some, some of those. It's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, old history, some of the old clubs and stuff there. So the tracking room, um, this was, do you remember the? What this I do. Would look this like? is where Stephen worked. He would sit here. Exactly. Yep. He'd work here, and the speakers were there. There's carpet, and uh, right. there were slats with yeah. slats along the wall. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, and then I, there's just a big kind of cloud up here. So we put all this in and um, took out the slats and. Yeah, everything's new, really. Put new hardwood floor in. Lovely. He had a little little section of uh, hardwood that he sat on and his desk was on and everything else was carpet. Right. So, you know, this, the wood that's here in the middle is actually his original wood, but it was maple 
but we stained it dark and then yeah. had to match that wood moving well, out. So can you tell the difference? No. Yeah. 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 But you know, the, the acoustics were for mastering, which is very different than Sure, it was very dead in this room. When, yeah. When he was in here. Had to had to try to liven it up a bit, and then you know, of course, the cloud and the wall, all the design that was uh, Dave Koch, yeah. that I think is in New York City. He designed, and then Brad Keeler built. Um, so they did a really good job. Yeah. It, it changed the sound of the team. whole room. It's not live, live sounding, but it's not exactly. It's live enough. Yeah, yeah. it is. It, it's a good sounding room, even with you know ten foot ceilings. And we, and we can leave this door open. And mic um, the hallway. And we mic yeah. the hallway. And that exactly. makes it sound four times bigger. It's incredible. Great. Well, I mean, <laughs> because everything is so soundproofed and isolated, it actually works. So we've done strings, drums. You can't hear it outside that breezeway door. We brought that beautiful piano. It sounds great from Salt Lake. Are you a piano player, Scott? A little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Boy, talk about being put on the spot. Well, that's the way it is. Little new agey thing for you. Aww. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Bravo. That was beautiful. Okay. So this is a, it's a nine foot, foot Samick concert grand. Nice. But some of the innards, legend has it that some of the innards were swapped or at least modified to make it more similar to a Steinway D. So it's affectionately known as the Frankensteinway. Frankenstein. <laughs> and we, Frankenstein. we had two pianos in Salt Lake City and we brought this one. The other one was a Yamaha C7. That we, I had a C7. I love those. Yeah. We sent that off to Nashville. And they love and kept it. This that one. sounds awesome. Yeah. Both good pianos. Wonderful. And again, this... Is a writer's room, we call it. So it has all tie lines um, through troughs going into the tracking room. Yeah, so this is my own custom desk that I brought in for my studio when I joined the company. Um, it's set up so that everything was in front of me as I composed. So Mike Prees, it's just kind of empty racks now, but right. um, it was set up for the way that I work. That's part of a that's part of a writing rig that we have. It's okay. basically a portable roll around rack um, yeah. that, that visiting composers and writers can come in and basically be autonomous. Nice. Writing and producing on their own. A couple of BAEs, retros, and uh, some Poltex there. Nice. Yep. Try to basically cover at least a really, really great. Laser Leisure? Yes. Yeah. Um, M-Pressors. Yeah, I, I own all those things. They're all wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Particularly love these. Yeah. He did, he did an amazing job on those. Yeah, it's incredible to think that some that little they thing sounds that like out. a huge 19-inch yeah. rat mount. Yeah. Well, and they're, they're so chunky. Yeah, yeah. There's just a difference. It's like the BAEs, you know, between yeah. those and like the the 1073 card that you get from Neve. That's just very different. You know, that allows people to come in and kind of be their own person. Great. And have a, at least a great, uh, you know, stereo. Yeah, that's really cool. And then, of course, in the in the studio, they could track out even farther because we had that rack. If you saw that as all the you know Neve pre's, so they could track a bunch of stuff. Oh, let's go and check that out. I, I yeah, saw it was that. a little a little rolly card. It's actually an extension of the console because it can be remote controlled from the console or from the studio. We keep this out here because there are some microphones that don't like that long cable run for some reason. They just want to be you know powered up here close right um so it works to to plug them in here and then run them to the control room but some of them if you try to go and use one of the pre's in the control room they just it's nice though i mean i remember tracking at conway and they had those um i don't know if they're 1081s or not i think they're 1081s and they were in the wall and remotely controlled mm -hmm. from the is it the Montserrat console it's i think it was monster console it's the george martin thing and uh, air studios at least and uh, it sounds phenomenal. Just short, short mic runs on the drums. Right. It it does make a difference. That's you know one of the reasons they exist. But it also moving here. You know the benefit was that somebody could do everything in this room. Mm -hmm. So you have enough inputs here Great. locally to track drums or do whatever. But yeah, you can you can remote from the Genesis or you know from a plug-in. Great. Um, so it's it's pretty convenient. 
That's so good. KRK, those are old KRK. Uh, very old. I couldn't even tell you. Uh, you know, those those would be like '90s, I would guess. But they're, you know, they wouldn't probably have a model number. I'm guessing so they're, they're custom. They're mastering grade speakers. So they probably have the Focal yes. uh, drivers when Focal right. used to make them. Yeah. Yep. So that's like you you couldn't probably find a pair like it. No, and you'd have to go to Focal to get them to build them for you. <laughs> right. Those drivers, yeah. So they at one point those were the mains in the studio in Salt Lake. And oh wow. Then, and then they eventually got relegated to talkback duty in the main big chapel. So I, wow. you know, I was like, uh, I don't want to lose them, kind of knowing how unique they are. So we yeah. bought them, and they look cool. They look great. So now they've been relegated to end tables, I guess. But I don't know if that's. No, I'll take them home. <laughs> I, 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 I can say I can take them home history. for you. History. Yeah. This is a tight room. This is where our mics are. Yeah. So this it serves this since the room is under twenty four seven surveillance. Like yeah. From we have a global security that can watch over our stuff for us all the time. Yeah. Which is kind of like who nice. gets that? Very nice. <laughs> yeah. So they, you know, they're mainly concerned with our network stuff, which is here, but also Got all 960. Of our stuff. Yeah. So is it, do you have this connected with Dante for, for any rooms? How do you know um, No, it's, this is all just kind of sitting here at the moment, but the idea is that we can patch in anything to right. any of the rooms. So if you okay. ever wanted to pull up one the of these hardware yeah. reverbs, yeah. you could. So we have, these are other things where I just couldn't, didn't have the heart to get rid of them. So, you know, the 960, the 480, 220. Get rid of these, get rid of the yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, it's all kind of there and just, you know, if, if somebody has the love and the patience, then they can use it. Yeah, that's great. But, yeah. Dave Jordan and Brian Colstrom made so many records using those. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, incredible reverbs. I mean, that's the thing, and, and stuff you don't see often, you know, like the 224. And, Not in this uh, condition. No. This is like brand new. Right. The sad part was that we had to cut the cables that went with the remotes because they were, there was, you know, cable run this fat with 10 billion cables in Salt Lake. It was like, you weren't pulling out that remote cable, so we just, Snipped it. So we have the remote. They're not like that. And somebody could wire them, you know, right. with the connectors pretty easily, but it was sad to do it. Lovely. It's the mic cabinet. So nonstop music. I think we first started in 88. Uh -huh. So they basically built up this studio over, you know, 30, 40 years where they were gathering pretty choice pieces of gear and microphones. Um, so there's a pretty good blend of old and new. They went through a time where, you know, studios at like universities had great mics. Mm -hmm. And at some point they thought they were going to upgrade. So they had to get rid of like old junk, like U67s and <laughs> U87s. Yeah, stuff that just, yeah. <laughs> it's like who, this, I can't believe people are still using tubes, you know, it's like get rid of that stuff. So that's, yeah. these two microphones actually came from Brigham Young University in Utah. Somehow they ended up with them, but there's a lot of these that are like that. It's it's a pretty good variety, and we have we have new stuff, you know, trying to some of the stuff that emulates like the Lucas mics. Yeah. So you have uh, two sixty sevens. What's that there? Is that a KM? Uh, SM. So it's a oh. stereo. Oh, SM12. SM2. SM2. Sorry. Yep. Wow. And nice. some of these, some of these littler guys that you don't see very often. I have one of those KM fifty six. Yep. Yeah, these are beautiful. Yep, a couple of those, which there's a, the old engineer in Salt Lake City actually had a, a 55, which you never see. I only see 53s, 54s, and 56s. I didn't yeah. actually know that it was a 55. I think, I'm pretty sure it was a 55, and it was like a one of those that you never see. I've but never it, seen it. One of the most incredible mics on acoustic guitar. 56, or like a violin or a mandolin, it's like yeah. it's just scary. It was just done, because it, the way it kind of compressed the sound is like, wow. And it's extra sparkly ads yeah. and yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, you know, you get into the, so we have old and new. Great. Um, versions of all that Field stuff. Field 51s, those are presumably all 87s. Yep. I Great. think we had about eight of those and now we're down to five functioning. There's, Great. You know, we have holes in our mic collection like anybody else, but there's, we, can make, fine. we can make music. You're, you're okay. Yeah, we'll do all right. You do all right. 
so these are offices. That's Maria that uh, Scott mentioned a minute ago. So she does all of our contracts and budgeting and um, some artwork. Quite right. a combo. Shannon, who is working remotely, these people are remote today, uh, uploads. We also represent third-party catalogs. So we put out anywhere between 40 and 60 albums a month. Yowza. And those are some we own and commission and then our third parties that we represent exclusively. So he handles all that. It's, yeah, Yowza's right. That's another little server room. Our first engineer when we moved into this building was Ryan Freeland, like I said, who's uh, since left the company. Um, we came in and we had all the kind of old, big, tall Mac Pro tower things. Sure. Um, know them well. But didn't really need them. Um, so we got a Mac Mini and, you know, got that as powerful as we could buy at the time. And then, you know, with this, we have three HDX cards in here. So that it just works. He loved UAD. So we are very you know, well put together in the UAD a lot department. Of UAD there, yeah, four yeah. satellites. So. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, he, I think he used that primarily. And of course those are, you know, you get into some of those UAD plugs are pretty hungry, you know, for the, the DSP. So wanted to make sure we had enough to we never ran into. I don't think you were. Either. No, I think we're all right. <laughs> I think we're okay. You got the symphony there as well as the uh, Avid ones. Yep. So 32 channel symphony, the, this stuff really, basically never gets turned on. We never hit that amount of track count, but we have it available. Right. Um, the JCF is just for printing back. Mm -hmm. um, so the Symphony all runs out through the uh, Delta, Sigma Delta, and it, you know, that's also a Ryan thing, but like Mark well, also works in that too, way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, lens a very distinct sound. It kind of has a great way of making it sound like a record, so. Um, the matrix is really, we have all the analog inputs available there, but we're mostly using it to drive our queue system, which is mm -hmm. Dante. So we have a digital audio labs, live mix system. That's what all those little boxes you see sitting around everywhere. Those are the headphone system that it's pretty cool because we can control their mix. It's 24 channels. Um, plus do all the naming you know, from the control room and then basically blast it out. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, the control room. The so control this also room. we totally revamped. What was this room before? It was a second mastering suite. I think I maybe came in. And there was a lathe in it. Oh. I don't even remember what this room looked like. It was, it was sort of similar to Marcuson's room in that you had a block of wood in the middle and then carpet all around and then I think it was the same kind of wood slats. Oh, I on think the you're side. right. It oh, was. so he, yeah, yeah. I think somebody was working in this. You're right. I remember. Yeah, I mean everything is different, and then of course there was, you know, there was talk of putting the control room in that producer room where I'm at, and even talk of like punching a window, but mm. that wasn't gonna work, you know, for anybody. Yeah. Well, this this works way better for clients, just the size of it, um, and then the the acoustics work better to having a bigger room like this, at least with this size of speaker. But yeah, the, the TV, we initially came in with a 65 inch, but on that wall, it was so small and it didn't, this, when we bumped it up, which I think this is 80, um, suddenly it felt like a window. So the right. camera out there, we're looking in on the studio, which is a kind of a cool thing to be able to do. Sure. So it's the Neve Genesis. Neve Genesis, um, 32 inputs. It's a hybrid uh, console for those who don't know much about it. So it is can be completely analog, um, but it also acts as a controller for Pro Tools. And like I said, it can remote control the the uh, forty eighty ones out in the room. Is this uh, is this the soft tube console one? Yep. And this is your Q system, the live mix here. Right. From any live mix box, you can basically control any other live mix box on the Dante you know, same Dante network. Do you have any perceptible latency? No, nope. I was worried about that, but it, you know, not at all. Great. Yeah, it's pretty incredible how fast it is. And there's, I mean, it's, you know, the adoption of Dante kind of everywhere as far as live sound goes. Yeah. yeah. Pretty telling, so I was kind of trusting and hoping. 
Um, and as it turns out, it works really, really well in this situation. So fantastic. Yeah. It's good as far as giving control to everybody. And then the, you know, just having the little touch. I mean, you can, you, the way you can group channels and stuff, it's, you know, they can read exactly what they're doing, you know, control every channel. They can control themselves. They control somebody else. I mean, it gets complicated to the point where they could get a mix going in their headphones and send that back over Dante and we can record it and hear like what they're hearing. Right. So outboard, pretty tasty. Yes. 165s. Very nice. Yep. The 160 with the variable attack and release. Yeah, the 160. Just like I do, you use it on auto. <laughs> well, the 165s were on the chopping block, and uh, really? they, were, they were pieces that Ryan wanted to keep just because they're vibey and, and great boxes. So he kind of insisted we keep them. And we did. Fours a lot. I mean, that's great if you can keep them, yeah. I mean, the difficulty with this kind of stuff is, is that it's beautiful and sounds amazing. But it's also incredibly valuable. You're looking at it like, I used this twice this week and it's worth how much? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, but then try to replace it. Exactly. I agree. You know, and that's and that's any of those things, like getting rid of one of those lexicon reverbs. It's like, do it and then try to get it back. You know? I just can't believe the condition of everything. It's like, it looks brand new. Yeah. Well, so keep this in mind with our studios. We mostly exist to for ourselves. Yeah. So this is not like having everybody coming in off the street sure. recording on your stuff with a thousand guest and there's engineers. There's not people smoking cigars uh, and whatever. Tightly, around. tightly controlled. Yeah. So the gear is well taken care of. And yeah, the studios always have been they look brand new. Smoke free, drink free. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, everything's in very good shape. Dynamite, Valley Peoples. Yep. Wow. So I kept those just because I love those on drums. Great. Some Rupert Neves down there, 5032s. Yep. Lovely. The obligatory and very necessary distresses. Although you've got all of the things that it models. Exactly. <laughs> in an individual. Yeah, but but then distressers in nuke mode, I was about to say nothing that. quite does that. And then the distressers just really, really graceful at attack and release in a way that some of these others aren't as far as being really, really precise. And it's super modern. You get somebody who comes in that knows that but doesn't know the other stuff. Right. Yeah, it's it's hard to get a bad sound on a distressor. They just, even if you're smashing the heck out of something, it sounds awesome. So you got the UBK stuff there. Mm -hmm. Yep, a number of the Fatsos. Like I said we did get rid of some of the UBK stuff. Had some of their uh, like Clarifonic and some of their other EQ. I think it was like a transient EQ kind of a thing. Obligatory and very necessary. Eleven seventy sixes. Yes. Yeah, it's still in really good shape, um, missing the lamps, which I think I bought and then maybe never got installed, but yeah, just standard stuff there. And two of your three Bricastis? Two of the three Bricastis and the, you know, the, I kept all three just because of how we work, especially right. with stems. If you can set up a template to bounce all your stems in one go, you can't do that with a Bricasti. So you have to have multiple to cover strings, brass, whatever, you know, needs a reverb on it. So you might be running the same reverb on three machines, but that way you can quickly, instead sure. of doing a real time bounce of four minutes to get that reverb, you can get them all in one pass. People have differing opinions. I think they still sound better than any plugin. Yeah, we, I, I did do some quite extensively on a record a few years ago and uh, really enjoyed them. Yeah, it matters a lot, especially in orchestral music, um, where just the tail is really going to play out. There's a lot of detail in those that you don't get with some of the convolution stuff. So, the retros. Yeah. Very nice. This is the function I always love to side chain. Great on bass guitar, and you just sit there and you find that sweet spot where the low end just breathes. And yeah, they're a favorite. I mean, it's it's easy to overdo it with them. Um, they're really really grippy, but they're so so nice. But then when you have underneath, I think is a sorely underrated, not talked about. I think the summit compressors are just unbelievable yeah and so easy and dumb to use right fast slow as cack you know what i mean it's right well they've they got the same kind of la2a thing going but they're just but they're so much so, so much better than la2a's yep. yeah, well great. you saw we have these and then we have the two pre's that you maybe yeah. saw in the yeah, rack in there nice. just too good to give up 
you know, they're they're so vibey and nothing else. Al Schmidt love those. You, you, the thing is, you could you could accidentally hit them really hard and not realize because they they they're they're yeah. just gorgeous sounding. Thermionic culture stuff. Yep, that was uh, I think that originally belonged to Mark Nelson. Um, oh really? We I traded him that for uh, one of his compressors a multi-band compressor that he has so nice oh some of the is that is that the helios stuff that um that al makes al sutton i don't know i don't know i know he's doing the helios stuff i just don't know if that's his one yeah some more neve pre's two eqs um in connections wonderful stuff yep we don't we don't have a ton of API um, for one reason or another. I don't know why that wasn't ever you know something that they bought into, but you know they never went that route. So we'll, we've got empty slots there, and I'm guessing that'll we'll probably fill that out with some more flavors like that. Yeah, the API pre's are always nice. Yeah. We, we love them on guitars. Yeah, I mean it, it's something kind of that seems to be missing from this whole setup. We don't have that flavor. And, and API pre's on drums had a mm -hmm. really certain sound, incredible, incredible sound. The spec EQs, yep, lovely, and then a lot of Shadow Hills. It's just another, you know, one of those boxes that nothing quite does it like it does. I've got to ask though, I know absolutely nothing about what the V seventy eight M tab is. That is that a, a, a version of a. Uh, Telefunken with the word V on it, or what? What is it? <laughs> they are they are Telefunken pre's. They are Telefunken pre's. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Um, there, I think there was a. I don't know who made them, but basically somebody took them and put them in these boxes. And so they are actual Telefunken pre's. Uh -huh. Put in. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I think I think that the what you're seeing there on the faceplate is not necessarily original, but it. Yeah. I'm not sure how that worked. Tab Funkenverk. Yep, but they are, you know, like so much of the gear, very, very, very vibey. And, uh, you know, it's to have that many of them is pretty unusual. Very nice. And then some Chandler stuff, which is yep. always great because EQs are beautiful. Very nice. Yeah. And then you, you're the ATC guy, aren't you? Yeah. So we did a shootout. I mean, it's once you get into speakers that big, it's a kind of a, big deal to do shootouts because sure. it requires people pulling up in big trucks and crates and like, writing very large checks. Well, we, I think, <laughs> I think to demo a pair, either of the ATCs or we had in the big version of the, the barefoots, like their big, big version. Mm -hmm. I think I had to pay like $700 in cartage for them to bring them in. They wouldn't let us touch them. They set up the stands, they set up the speakers and then left them here for a few days. Yeah. I mean, it went against the purchase price eventually, but yeah, it's just kind of that thing. So we had in a pair of the ATCs. This was in COVID yep. times. We decided, I decided that I liked those, you know, more than the barefoot big ones um, and then had to order them and then had to wait Perfect. months and months. And then, you know, somebody rolled them off the boat from England and said, here's your speakers. And they had just been built. I mean, you know, Great. it was that kind of thing. Fantastic speaker, obviously. Very full range, super, super tight bass um, to an extent. And then you don't get the sub subs. So we have a Genelec 7070A sitting behind the console to handle the really low stuff, which is important for us. Because Genelec took ours back and we haven't got it back. <laughs> I, saw, I brought three with me down here and I sold two of them. But it's, it's important for what we do. Just, you know, as far as sure. trailer music and other stuff with a lot of really low end, you have to hear what you're doing. The, the ATCs will get you so far, but then they don't necessarily cover those really low lows, which the, surprisingly the Barefoots do with their built-in sub. So yeah, the Barefoots were Ryan's choice. That's his, you know, main rig. He mixes on those and obviously gets incredible results. So um, we'll see if they remain. Two spots, uh, two pieces of gear, um, we've got the older Trinov, which oh, okay. made more sense in the room in Salt Lake City where they had to do a lot more correction. It was just a terrible room. Mm -hmm. This room is not terrible. 
This room is very well designed, super consistent front to back. Like right. if it's not the usual thing where you're sitting on the couch in the back going, all here is base. It's, this room is great. Mm -hmm. So, but there might be problems. Eventually we'll get that up and running and see where we're at phase wise, just because that's a kind of the advantage of the tree knob is that per band you can flip phase, which is kind of crazy. Incredible, yeah. Um, and then this mass select box, the MP2, that's the, so basically a high frequency limiter. And mm -hmm. that was a Ryan Freeland favorite. I think that's, I don't know if I'm giving away, if Ryan ever watches this, giving away his special secret <laughs> sauce secret. But that's basically, I think, how he controlled a lot of his high end. You don't see a lot of those around, but. I've never seen one, but that's great. Yeah. Mass select, you would obviously, uh, you would, uh, you, you would think of it as a mastering tool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, quite expensive for what it. How much, much is quite trick. expensive? I think it, I think it was about four thousand bucks. That's quite expensive. It's something with three knobs on mm -hmm. it. Yes. So it, yeah, <laughs> I haven't used it, but I'm guessing it does something incredibly magical. Well, we should try it. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. This is my office, and this was a writer's room. A vocal coach had a stand up piano in here and taught. But again, there's no floating floor. I'm not connected anymore. Mm. It's just my office. But I That's love fantastic. it. fantastic. And I have this awesome skylight. I don't have any windows, but. And then I always like to ask people, um, well, I used to have that hanging at my house, this photo, and I yeah. have people guess who those people are before they could get a drink, but. Um, before they can get a drink? Yeah, but it was too hard. Oh, I mean. I don't know who she is. That was a uh, inside spread of a CD cover that I took a picture of and then blew it up. Oh, wow. I didn't have the album. It's Booker T and the MGs. Oh, I should have guessed that because now I can see. Oh, dear. I spoke to him at a, at a show for 89, 90, and I came up to him and I said, what strings do you use? Because I, I was dumb. I was a kid. I was trying to be smart. So I asked him what strings he used, and he's like, I don't know, I only change them when I break one. I do have gear in here. That's right. Has anybody heard of these speakers? Got to get the resident German speaker to pronounce the names. They're, uh, go, look on, go look on the back of that and see what that says. I, I've never heard of them, but they sound awesome. In proper German, you say Regie Lautsprecher. Wow. Mm -hmm. Regie Lautsprecher. Very, <laughs> you don't see those speakers around a lot. Again, quite expensive for the size and what they do, but... Um, they were the choice of Glenn Nybar, who was the one of the engineers in Salt Lake City, had those as his main speakers and mixed incredible amounts of orchestral yeah, they music sound good. on them. Yeah, yeah, they they swing way above their weight as far as like. Well, that's why they were a loudspreaker. Very, yeah. very loudspreaker. Yeah. <laughs> so she has the, the little baby face pro you know, basically going right into those and they, nice. they put out a lot of low end. So Pat, you're producing here. And it's like executive you know, you know, producing. Yeah. I don't turn any knobs except loud, the loud knob. <laughs> the uh, loud on the loud sprecher. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it is amazing. You can just sit at your desk and I'm working with people all over the world. Did you work with the chili peppers? Um, this is my fiance. Oh, I see. <laughs> he doesn't look like that now. Right, right. But he looked like that then. Uh, this wow. was, uh, they signed on their first tour. He played drums with them for the first two albums. And on their first tour, they signed this for his mother. I, I was wondering why the dear mom. Yeah. And so when she passed away, this was in her stuff. And Cliff won't hang it at the house. I, I, I saw them on this tour. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw them right at the beginning. I mean, when Slovak was still in the band, when he was obviously when he was still alive. Um, yeah, I saw that. I, I think I saw them in Marquee 80. But then you, you saw them? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was amazing. It was absolutely nuts because they were like punk funk. Yeah. And, and it would, Flea was just like, it was just insane. Yeah, it was such a good time. I saw them and I think... A couple months before, I saw um, Bad Brains. I mean, it was just an insane time for music. It was really good. He is from Ohio, and he came out and um, was just mesmerized by the whole punk scene. 
But right. he played with the weirdos and right. he was in that whole scene. Yeah. Yeah. With his mohawk. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Oh, right. Conference room. Some little golds. Oh, these are super gold. Super gold. Oh, nice. Do they have the dark sex? Uh, I don't think they have that mod in them. I'm uh, guessing they're just, because they were. Don't tell Eric. He'd I'm sure upset. they went to Salt Lake City and never left there as far as getting that swap. So I initially had those in my office and I was like, wait, I can't work with these. They're, I mean, they're is... very, they're very cool, but it's, it's yeah. a hi-fi kind of a sound. You know, it's not. God bless Scotland. These would have been made in Scotland. Yeah. St. Berenger bought them. They, there is no Scottish tenor anymore. Yeah. Still, still worth, you know, a lot of money. And it's just one yeah. of those things where, again, you give it up. How can you get it back? No. no, no. So they look cool in here. I know that they look cool. What we call dual concentric. Tenor's Tannoy's name yep. for that for that system. What do yeah, you call I it? I don't Coaxial. know. If, we well, we had 10 of the DMT-2s. That was kind of, you know, the 90s speaker. Yeah. And I've sold off all but one pair and then have a bunch of spare parts and stuff. So it's... It's still great that you still have it. We have moved away from Tenoy for the most part, but can't, can't get rid of the super golds. Yeah, yeah. Dave Jordan had the uh, little golds. When we had four pairs and I borrowed a pair for like five years, I used to just use them with my NS10s because they were like, they were like NS10s on steroids. Mm -hmm. And he taught me this trick of like monitoring at a certain volume. When you got the kick right, the speaker would kind of go, and do this little. It's a visual thing. <laughs> it's a visual thing. Yeah. It is. I think you can mix well on pretty much any speaker if you know sure. what it looks like and sounds like. So, <laughs> and, and the look is, because I had a pair of Tenoy reveals when I was a kid, just starting out and that's, I knew when I had overdone it because those woofers would be doing this. Right. But there was no sound. I couldn't hear it. I just knew that they were doing that. And I was like, oops, I right. overdid it there. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks ever so much, Scott. Yeah. This Thank you guys awesome. for coming Thank in. Thank you. you very much. Very nice to meet you and your team. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. Warner Chapel production music. Warner Chapel <laughs> production music. I don't know which camera I'm talking to, but that's where we're at. There's, yeah. Skylight Studios. Just, yeah, there it is. Just overcomplicate it. Marvelous. Thank you very much. Thank you.